So thanks for that introduction. So as, as was mentioned, my name is Paul Reed. I'm a principal, solution, a principal product manager um, in our Boston office. And I'm joined with one of our solution architects, Scott Franks, who's going to do a demo later on to try and keep it fresh so you don't just have to listen to me and get, uh, watch slides. So just to level set, I'm going to give you an introduction to uh, our broader AWS storage portfolio. Super important as we start to talk about hybrid storage, because hybrid storage is all about leveraging those in cloud storage assets, those in cloud storage services from your on prem data center and bridging that gap between on prem and in the cloud. In particular, we're going to look at AWS Storage Gateway, services I'm one of the product managers for, and look at how Storage Gateway can help you bridge that gap between your data center and AWS. We look at the three types of gateway file gateway, volume gateway, and tape gateway, and I'll go into a lot more detail about what the differences are and, and, and how you can use them. Um, as we get into this presentation. Scott will do a demo of, of File Gateway, a particularly exciting demo. We'll get to that in a moment. So just to give you the overall view of AWS storage, in the center of the slide, we have three core, three core storage types, file storage, block storage, and object storage. File and block are very common from what you may expect or what you may have within your data center. Object is sort of the new kid on the block that came around as the cloud evolved, as the cloud grew. On the left-hand side, we see a number of services and a number of offerings that help you get data into or out of the cloud. We think of those as data movement services, data transfer services. And on the right-hand side, once your data is in the cloud, there are a lot of services, either first-party services from AWS or services supported by some of our partners, many of whom are down in the expo hall, expo hall that can use that data once it's in the cloud, can make use of that data. You're bringing it to the cloud for a reason. Those are the services that can help you use that data. Customers come to AWS for a variety of workloads. On the left-hand side, we see things like traditional backup and, and restore. And on the right-hand side, we see traditional enterprise applications that now will run in the cloud on fully managed AWS infrastructure. And a lot of things in between, obviously, for this audience, compliance is super important. Again, we have a lot of uh, compliance and regulatory, um, regulatory uh, sign-offs that AWS has. I'm sure many of you have attended sessions earlier today that discuss some of those. We talked about the services on the left that help you make use of that cloud storage from perhaps your traditional on-prem data centers. We're going to talk about Storage Gateway in more detail today, but there are other services. Kinesis allows you to stream data into AWS. FileSync allows you to move file systems into EFS, Elastic File System. S3 Transfer Acceleration allows you to move objects into or out of S3, our, our object storage service. AWS Direct Connect provides you a direct connection between your data center and one of our local uh, edge locations to give you some dedicated bandwidth into or out of the cloud. And as I mentioned, we have a number of partners that provide a variety of offer offerings that help you move data and use your data in the cloud, no matter whether your applications run in the cloud or in your data centers. And last but by no means least, our AWS Snowball, Snowball family, or Snow family, which includes Snowball, Snowball, Snowmobile, Snowball Edge, a service that allows you to ship data. So if, you're, if you don't have enough network or you're in a disconnected environment, but you need to move data into or out of the cloud, the Snow family allows you to do that by shipping data physically um, through ruggedized devices. We'll go through each of the core storage services. And again, this is just sort of a primer, um, because as we get into Storage Gateway, we'll see why, why understanding these storage services is important. Amazon S3, simple storage service, is our object storage service that I'm hoping everybody in the audience has heard about. Hands up, anybody who hasn't? I won't embarrass you. Um, allows you to store, collect, and analyze data in the cloud through a REST API, um, built for a variety of use cases, um, uh, most notably things like uh, backup restore, data lakes, analytics, and again, that uh, tail of applications that can use object storage directly. Glacier is another service that allows you to uh, store data at a, uh, more cost effectively. So it's about a fifth the cost of S3, um, allows you to store things uh, for archival purposes, Slightly different, uh, slightly different API, slightly different mechanism of accessing data. Um, we have some active uh, components that allow you to query your data while it's in archive. You can use it for things like tape replacement. And it has a number of capabilities that allow you to store data there from a regulatory standpoint. So things like um, Vault Lock that allows you to uh, provide a 
write once, read many capability. We think of Glacier as a standalone service and also as a storage class. So if you're putting data into S3, we have a number of different storage classes within S3, and they're offered at a slightly different price point. Um, all of them have the same degree of durability and availability. So on the left-hand side, we see S3 standard. This is the one that most people will be very familiar with. And on the right-hand side, we see Glacier. I can write lifecycle policies that reason about my data and move objects, individual objects, between these storage classes, depending on what my business needs in terms of um, its cost and access to that data. So we have standard infrequent access, which was launched a couple of years ago, S3 one zone infrequent access, which was launched at our San Francisco summit earlier this year, and Glacier. And you can move data between these storage classes either individually or through policies. Coming out of object storage into maybe more traditional storage that many of you most might be familiar with, we have EBS, Elastic Block Store. This is traditional block storage direct attached to your EC2 instances. Think of it as disks. Um, provides you that super high IOP, super low latency access to direct attached storage. Durable, you can disconnect from an instance, reattach it to a different instance. Um, you can provision uh, EBS volumes independently. They now allow you to elastically scale them. And you can choose between a number of different performance profiles depending on what your application's needs are. The third component to that core set of storage services is Elastic File System, which provides you a file system in the cloud, fully managed file system that your EC2 instances connect, connect to. You don't have to provision anything. You don't have to scale it. You simply get a file system that you can read and write data to and build um, practically limitless sized file systems with zero management costs. So let's start to jump into what we think of as hybrid. So we have these core storage building blocks. We see sort of two, two classes of customer. There's a customer that's all in the cloud. They're cloud natives. They built their application from applications or their business around the cloud. Their applications live in the cloud, and they're sort of these all-in customers. Now, many, many customers want to be all-in, um, but they have existing infrastructure within their data centers. And so they have to transition or migrate that into the cloud. So we think of this interim step as hybrid, where you have some workloads that run in the cloud, some workloads that run in your data center, and you're having to bridge this gap. And for some customers, that's gonna be a very short period of time. Some customers, it could be long period of time. It could be many years before you've actually moved everything from your data centers into the cloud, if that's where you want to go. So once we're in that hybrid mode, one of the things that's super important is to think about how do I access data? How do my applications access data? How do they store data? Where are they storing it? And how do I do that in an efficient way, such that my applications are sort of blind to the fact that we're now using the cloud? Storage gateway is one of the ways that we can do that. Gateways in general are one of the ways we can do that. So at its heart, storage gateway connects what you have on premises today, users, applications, devices potentially, to one of our AWS regions. A lot of customers will adopt the service for backup and archive. It's a very easy on-ramp to the cloud. Um, you can see the cost benefits of uh, cloud storage very quickly. You can get comfortable with using cloud services. You can get comfortable with operationalizing it within your environment. Storage Gateway will put your data into the cloud in its native format, into S3, Glacier, or EBS. That's super important as we look at the next part of the journey that many customers take which is to say, now that my data's in the cloud and now that Gateway can provide me this native storage in AWS, what's that larger ecosystem of tooling and workloads that I can now run on top of that data? So we see customers starting with backup, DR, and archive, and then branching out into many of these other use cases once their data is in the cloud. There's lots of AWS services that will help you do that, from EMR to Athena, obviously EC2 if you're attaching block storage devices, Lambda, and CloudFront for doing things like data distribution. Storage Gateway provides three different types of storage. File storage, we talked about EFS, so we have file storage here. Block storage, we talked about EBS, and tape storage. For file storage, we're storing your files as objects in S3. For volume storage, we're giving you a block device that's backed by storage in the cloud. For tape gateway, we're giving you not just tape storage, but the devices that your applications expect to manage tape, so we're giving you both device emulation and storage. We'll go into all three of these gateway types in a lot more depth as we get deeper into the presentation. 
But no matter which type of gateway you're using, the architecture, the blocks and, blocks and arrows diagram looks the same. So on the left-hand side, we have our traditional file, volume, and block storage that our applications are going to uh, need. You access the service through a gateway, which today is provided as a virtual machine, which you can run on VMware, Hyper-V, or you can even run it in EC2 if you choose. The gateway then provides standard storage protocols to your applications, and then uses HTTPS to efficiently move that data up into AWS to our backend services. Once there, we store it natively into the AWS core storage services for you. The gateway is providing both protocol conversion from standard storage protocols to sort of these cloud storage protocols. He's doing some data caching to give the illusion to your applications that they're talking to file, block, or tape storage locally. And he's trying to optimize that connection um, to move data as efficiently and as quickly as possibly into AWS. Objects for S3, snapshots in terms of EBS block devices, and, and uh, archival for Glacier, for tapes in Glacier. Um, the service launched in 2016, and our pace of innovation has not slowed down, and we don't intend it to. Um, last year, we had 12 feature launches. We expanded into more regions. Um, we became HIPAA eligible for those uh, healthcare workloads, and we continue to iterate on features driven by requests from customers like yourselves at forums like this to make the service more usable for the workloads that you want to use the service for. This year, we haven't slowed down our pace. We launched in the GovCloud region earlier this year. Um, we've added integration with CloudWatch events, so the gateway can now become an active part of your workloads, telling you when data has moved and telling you when things have happened so that you can automate downstream workloads as data moves around. We've added encryption for files, volumes, and tapes using our key management service, KMS. And we haven't stopped there, and I'm super happy to announce that today we just launched SMB for File Gateway, which has been a long ask for customers that allows you to store and access objects in your S3 buckets directly from Windows using um, uh, Windows, Windows SMB protocol. So it allows you to reduce your on-prem storage through Storage Gateway with a fully managed local cache. So your applications think they're talking to real storage, but it's really off in the cloud. And your storage is in S3, so we go back to that core storage service, the durability and availability that that affords you. Customers are using File Gateway, um, uh, either with the existing NFS interface or the new SMB interface, for things like hybrid workloads to get data into the cloud so it can be used by some of our downstream services, or for things like backup and archive um, to store data in the cloud at that cost-effective cloud storage price point. If we dive into some of the technical details, we're supporting SMB v2 and v3, and the gateway becomes part of your AD domain. It joins your domain and then authenticates users against AD to provide access to the share and access to the underlying objects in S3. Um, so as far as your Windows clients are concerned, it looks like an SMB file share, and on the back end, that's all mapped into S3. So let's look at file gateway, and then we'll do volume and tape. Um, and Scott will come up in the middle of there and give us a demo of File Gateway. So File Gateway, your applications see an NFS or SMB, uh, an NFS export or an SMB file share. The gateway takes care of then taking that data and uploading it to objects in your bucket. And should you choose, you can obviously use that lifecycle capability that we have within S3 to move that data through the storage classes even all the way down into Glacier. This is your S3 bucket, super important that the gateway is really putting data into your S3 bucket. So the files that you see on the file system are the objects you'll have in S3. We access that bucket using a role that you control, you own. You're not opening up your bucket to a service role. This is something that you roll, and the gateway um, adopts that role in order to access your bucket. We provide you a lot of configuration and controls over how file clients can access that data and how the data is stored or accessed in S3. So just to look at that one-to-one -one mapping again, maybe a little simple. In this instance, the namespace that my file applications is, same as, is the same as the namespace in S3, the key space in S3. Now, this is really important because now I can use the same namespace for my business rules in S3 about managing that data. Maybe I want to uh, lifecycle uh, certain folders or certain prefixes down to a different storage class or perform cross-region replication. Maybe I want to apply tags to certain um, files. 
I can do that because the namespaces match between my file and my ob files and my objects. Whether I'm using Windows or Linux, the same thing happens. So again, here I can have a Linux client talking to a different bucket. What he'll see again is the same namespace. This is one-to-one mapping between files and objects. Um, one of my colleagues likes to say, if you create a file called word.doc or document.doc, you'll have an object in S3 called document.doc. I mentioned that we give you a lot of configuration over how, how um, both the file client can access data and how the data is stored in S3, and some of the options are here. Again, you can restrict access for the file clients, either by IP for the NFS side or by AD. They are valid and invalid users and groups on the SMB side. We allow you to export buckets read-only so that uh, clients can only read but not modify data. Um, we allow you to do some default permissioning, which is important if there's already objects in your bucket and you want to expose those as files. You may want to control who can access those objects because I, I don't know from a file system standpoint who should be able to access them, so we can default that for you. And on the NFS side, we have some permissioning um, pieces. <coughs> on the S3 side, again, I mentioned we, uh, we, you give us a role, so um, you can control what the gateway can do to your bucket through that role. Um, you can choose the storage class that data goes into, so you could actually choose um, standard infrequent access or one's own infrequent access as the initial storage class for your data if that's what your workload requires. Um, you can choose encryption to use our KMS service to encrypt objects as they're put into S3. We support a number of other S3 characteristics. Guess MIME type is an interesting one because it allows you to take that data, apply the correct MIME types to it, potentially distribute that through something like CloudFront and browsers downstream will know that this file that ends in .jpg is actually a JPEG. And so we'll render it accordingly. So there's a whole set of S3 features that uh, are enabled or configurable here in terms of how data gets put into S3. Let's unwrap the gateway a little and talk about how the gateway does what it does. Um, we talked about how it does protocol transformation, it has local caching, and it does efficient reads and writes. So, so what's really going on under the covers within the gateway here? Inside the gateway, there are two things that are interesting, a cache and an index. And we'll talk about the cache first. So when my application goes to read data, he's going to read data from the cache. Um, it's a read-through cache. So if the data's in the cache, I'm going to serve it straight up to your application at, at LAN speeds. That's super important for some applications. They don't see increased latency. They can read data. And again, the illusion is that the data is all there. If data's not in the cache, we'll go fetch it from S3, put it into the cache, and then serve it up to your application. Your application will see increased latency, but that's really the only difference as far as, the gateway, as, far as your application is concerned. And again, we're going to try and efficiently just read the bytes that you want with a little bit of heuristics to read ahead if we see you're doing a streaming application to make sure data is pre-cached for you. On the other side, when you write data, we're going to write data into the cache first and then act your application and tell your application, yep, we've got that, you can move on. Then we're going to asynchronously upload that data using highly parallel multi-part uploads. We're only going to move the change data. We're going to try and as, as efficiently as possible move the changes that you made to a file into S3 and reconstitute the object in S3 with the changes that you made. We're going to try and do that as quickly as possible because that's where the durable storage is in S3. If you're writing data or reading data, it's going to remain in the cache. We don't preemptively evict just because we've written. It stays in the cache. It's the most recently accessed data from a reader or write perspective, so we're going to leave it in the cache until we don't have any space to store any new data. And then we'll evict the coldest data out of the cache. So the cache is going to contain your working set. Your bucket can be much, much larger than the cache, and we'll just cycle the cache automatically. So the cache is fully managed on your behalf. You don't even need to think about it. The other interesting thing that's inside the gateway is this metadata and object index. So that helps us perform efficient file system operations. So, for example, if you're trying to list a directory, I don't want to have to go to S3 in order to pull all that data and suffer the latency of pulling that data, so we have a cache of metadata that the gateway also keeps, and again, that's a hot cache, so we recycle data out there, which allows you to have an endless bucket with could have billions of objects in it the gateway knows about some subset of those based on what's been accessed recently. In that instance, when you perform one of those operations, we're going to get that data from the metadata cache, the metadata index. That means that those operations will be efficient, again, as file applications expect. The data's not in the cache. We're going to go fetch it from S3, pull it into the metadata cache, and then serve it up to your application using S3's list objects. 
request. Again, all of that happens under the covers. It's synchronous as far as your application is concerned. He'll just see slightly increased latency. If he goes and looks at that directory again, it's in the cache, so he's going to get that snappy response. I mentioned that the cache is a write-back cache, which means you write to the cache first, your application is acknowledged, and then we asynchronously upload. So how do I know when my data is in S3? Because I have a workload that's waiting for it. Maybe I'm uploading a gene sequence and I want to perform analysis in the cloud, or I'm uploading a backup and I want to validate that that backup is, is coherent and, and correct. This instance, if I write data to the gateway, I can then call an API on the service. It's a, S3, it's a standard AWS API supported by the um, CLI, SDK, or through our console, to tell me through CloudWatch when this data is available in S3. So the gateway is going to asynchronously upload that data. Then he's going to send you a CloudWatch event to tell you that that data is available for you in S3, and your workload can now kick off and read that data direct from S3. This instance, all of these downstream services can now access that data. You can automate that end-to-end -end flow from a file-based application generating data pushing it through the gateway into S3, and then processing downstream in the cloud. No user interaction, it can all get automated. <coughs> so what happens when I generate an object and put that object in the bucket? Maybe my workload completes and he puts some result set into the, into the S3 bucket. How does the gateway know about this if he's providing this caching layer on top of my S3 bucket? Again, we have another API that allows you to tell the gateway, I made some changes in S3, just validate your cache, validate what you, your view of the world matches what S3's, S3 has stored. We call that the refresh cache API. In this instance, the gateway is gonna do a list bucket as he did initially when the file client came in to make sure that what he thinks of as the shape of the bucket, the objects in the bucket, are representative of his, his metadata, and he's gonna update that metadata index accordingly, serving those files to your, serving those new objects as files to your file client. And again, we've added a CloudWatch event here so that you can automate that workflow in the opposite direction. So you can now automate a file-based workload because the files are now available to him. I'm gonna hand over to Scott now who's gonna show some of this in action, um, assuming the demo gods, are they demo gods, uh, with us, um, and uh, show some of this and then I'll come back on and talk a little about um, our volume gateway and our tape gateway. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the file backup via SMB. This is actually an hours old service that we just launched, we're really excited. Um, <clears throat> the way this works, like Paul just explained, is we're gonna write the file to your SMB share, it'll go into your local data cache, and then, then should come to your S3 bucket. So let's get started. Uh, let's see. So here's our S3, uh, so, First thing I want to show you that we give you the instructions for mounting your SMB uh, shares right here, and this is the, the AWS console if, if you're not familiar with it. So there's your instructions for mounting SC3 shares, and here's our S3 bucket that we're going to back up to. Now we go over to a Windows a Windows server. So here is what I've done: is we've mounted the storage gateway volume as an F drive. And what do, what do all you storage administrators, do I have storage administrators in the room, I hope? A few? What's, on your, what's filling up your local workspaces? What's cat pictures, right? <laughs> That's what I mean. I, I had 14 terabytes of cat pictures when I, at the last enterprise I worked at. So we're going to copy those cat pictures right to the cloud where it's a low-cost storage option. Hang on for a second. It's not going to work. So we're going to copy those to the cloud. You'll see that they just show up here in my storage, in my F drive. Now we're gonna come back to, my S3 bucket, we're gonna refresh our view, and you will see that the cat pictures are now stored on S3 storage. 
So that's pretty nice because what you can do is tear off some of the, some of those some of that low value file share you know high you know, stuff that you don't need very very you know, high highly available to your S3 storage and save yourself some or save your organization substantial amounts of money. Uh, so the, the but that's not really where your critical data is, right, Paul? No. Sorry. <laughs> but cat pictures are great, but where's my critical data in my organization? <laughs> the critical data, where is your critical Missed data? That's my live? cue, sorry. <laughs> the critical data lives in structured data, right? So we care about databases, we care about our applications. So what we're gonna what we want to show today is, and this is actually a, a multifaceted uh, demo. So we've got a database here. Uh, I'm gonna execute my query just so you can see it's up and running live. This is my AdventureWorks database. If you're a Windows, I'm told that this is a Windows, uh, a common Windows, you know, database for testing data. So what we're going to do is back it up right back there to our our F uh, that our storage gateway appliance, and execute query. So you'll notice that this is AdventureWorks seven. Okay, so my database just did a basically a full backup to AdventureWorks seven. So now let's go back to S3. And refresh again. And you'll notice that AdventureWorks 7 has now been backed up to the cloud. So now my critical data has moved very seamlessly to S3 storage. So this critical is. Critical 7 you're nothing about. So no, that's not true. Because there's, there's the, all those tools that Paul just talked about with file upload complete can actually notify your SQL server that, hey, this point right. in time backup is now complete. So now if you need to do your, for, to, to accomplish your restores, you want to say, hey, I want to capture log files perhaps, which are smaller backups, right there, you can have those right there in place as well. So this allows you to build a very effective uh, recovery strategy. So this is, that was uh, SQL Server Backup Dust Restore. So there's a slide that I need to show you <laughs> here. And so this, so this is the, the magic that we, you know, we're talking about. There are several parts here. This is the most important. Um, we've got through the, the domain controller. So once again, we're going to you know, use the domain controller, integrated AD access. We're using your native SQL agent to write all the way to S3. We can lifecycle this, this, these database snapshots now in real, you know, in real time. You can start the minute they land, they can start being rolled off to infrequent storage. They can be rolled off to Glacier. You can version these backups as well so that you have multiple copies, you know, you have, you have uh, point in time copies of them over time. There's a lot of things that you can do, but the power is that, that Paul was just talking about is in that bottom tier. Here's one implementation where you can build a very, very uh, robust backup strategy using CloudWatch and our na and native AWS services integrating with what you already do today. Now, so does anybody want to see me restore this in a different region? This is where it gets a little hairy. So I just backed up my, my database it, to the, from the cloud to S3 in Virginia, right? So now I, so if I say, hey, I want that same database in Ohio. Let's see if this is Ohio. All right. So this is a remote SQL box. Um, the first thing I've got to do is, you'll see this is my S3 console. I'm going to refresh my console there so I can see this guy. And I'm going to download that. Okay, so there we go. So now that, that backup is in Ohio, and, and that can be easily automated with a, a, a variety of uh, AWS SDKs. Uh, let's minimize instead. So now all I've got to do is come here. Oh, the, dang it. Come here and I'm not a Windows driver if you can't tell. Uh, I need a mouse. Trying to right click on my, my Mac is not helping. I apologize. Nope. <laughs> I, I'm stuck. 
So, um, so anyway, all you have to do is do a right click on your, on your database and restore, and it restores in, in, in seconds. So I apologize for the, the failure there. Um, anyway, so that's how you can do, so this allows you to, and this, this, this entire process can be automated in, the, in seconds as well. So you can massively move, using Storage Gateway, you can move hundreds of databases to the cloud um, to move your critical data to, to S3, either in a new distant region or um, for disaster recovery purposes. Thanks. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. So again, kind of nice to show how a Windows application that really knows nothing about AWS, doing what Windows does and what if you're a SQL Server admin, what you'd normally do to back up your database. In this instance, the data is moving into S3 as an object, as Scott mentioned. You've then got all the capabilities of S3 in terms of being able to lifecycle, cross-region, version, you name it, because your backups are named how you want. There's no opaque data. And you can then take those backups and either directly import them into SQL, import them into one of our RDS SQL Server instances, or pull them back on-prem, maybe in a disaster recovery site. Um, so just a neat use that allows Storage Gateway, Windows, applica Windows applications using Storage Gateway to store and access data in Amazon S3. I'm going to switch tack away from File Gateway. Obviously, we're pretty excited having just launched SMB today, so that's why we opened with that one. Um, to talk a little bit in the second half of the session, or second third, I guess, um, about volume and tape gateway and how they can also be used to help you bridge that gap between your data center and AWS in terms of providing hybrid cloud storage. So volume gateway, um, if you cast your mind back, provides you block storage on-prem. Um, your applications read and write blocks. We store them in AWS. Again, very similar internals to File Gateway where we're providing a cache of the most recently accessed data. We're efficiently moving that data up into AWS so that it's durably stored in AWS. There was a typo on this slide. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, the uh, snapshots can be uh, taken um, of these uh, volumes on-prem, and they surface as EBS snapshots to you. Um, so you can use that as a tool to migrate or restore data in the cloud, and we'll look at some of the migration and restoration scenarios in a moment. Um, and we see customers using this service for a lot of things. Again, migration, disaster recovery, and restore are the common ones. But again, it's another way to tier storage off from your on-premises SAN into the cloud to provide that lower, fo smaller footprint on-prem for your block storage. Volume Gateway has two different types, depending on your use case stored mode and cached mode. In stored mode, all of your data lives on-prem, so this is super useful for applications where the working set of data is not um, appropriate for a cached model. I need, I need low latency access to all of my data. I don't know what I'm, I'm getting no cache for use, I don't know which parts of my data set I need. My application can't suffer that additional latency that it would get from getting a cache miss and pulling the data into the cache. So in stored mode, 100% of your data is stored locally on a, on a physical uh, piece of media, physical disk, and we asynchronously back it up into AWS so you have a recovery point, a, a snapshot in the cloud in case you were to lose that primary volume. At any point in time, you can take EBS snapshots of this volume, which you can then use for servicing as another EBS volume or bringing back on premises or bringing potentially to a second site. Cache mode is similar to how we earlier talked about file gateway, where we're going to keep a subset of that data in a cache locally. All of your data is stored in AWS. All of your data is in the cloud. But we're going to manage, fully manage a cache of, of the hot working set of data on the gateway, which allows you to reduce your on-premises storage footprint to much smaller than the data set. Single volume gateway will support up to 32, 32 terabyte LUNs. It's about a petabyte of data. All we ask is that you give us 150 gigabytes of cache or more. Again, depends on your uh, workload. Your workload may demand more than that as its working set. Um, we have a whole set of CloudWatch metrics, I didn't mention CloudWatch metrics, that allow you to monitor the performance of that cache to see whether your cache is working appropriately, how many cache misses you're getting, and therefore the latency that your application might see from accessing data. Maybe you're getting too many cache misses so you could increase the size of your cache because your working set is larger than I can keep on premises and manage for you. We mentioned that you can take snapshots, and this is one of those things that um, once you get your head around is a really, really interesting capability. The snapshots that we take are a snapshot of your on-prem volume. 
So even though data is in flight between the gateway and the back end, when you take a snap, you get a snap of the volume from the perspective of the application. So we'll manage data being in flight and give you an EBS snapshot of that volume at that point in time. Snapshots are incremental. So the first snap is gonna be a full, and then subsequent to that first snap, we're gonna do incrementals on that. So in this instance, we build up a volume, A, B, C, D. We've taken three snaps over the life of this volume, so we see snap one, snap two, and snap three. We're not storing full copies every time. Let's look at how we can use snapshots. So there's sort of three use cases here. I can either take a snapshot and use it to restore data back to my on-premises environment. I can take a snapshot and use it potentially because I'm migrating that block device, that, that volume into the cloud. Or I can use it, another capability that we call volume cloning to do a potentially hot DR failover into the cloud. Maybe I have no snapshots. In the case of data recovery, here's a very similar setup to what we were showing earlier. We have three snaps of this volume. Maybe I wanna restore a file from uh, an earlier version of the volume, I can take snap two in this instance and create a new volume, a new virtual volume in the cloud and surface that as a new iSCSI target for my application to go and get access that older data on the volume. Could be to the same data center or you could spin up a second gateway in a different data center. Some of our customers do this uh, restoration in cloud. And here's our in-cloud use case. Again, this is commonly used for migration. I have a block device on premises. I bootstrap it into the cloud. I take a snap of the volume. I create an EBS volume from that snapshot. I attach that to an EC2 instance. Allows me to migrate whole block devices. Now, the third scenario is really about disaster recovery using a different capability of snapshots called volume cloning. I mentioned earlier that the gateway is asynchronously uploading your data into AWS to make sure that it's safe, safe and stored in the cloud. What happens if I don't have a recent snapshot and my primary data center has a problem? In this instance, I have a recovery site. That could be a second data center. It could, you, uh, one of our AWS regions could be a second data center. If I lose my primary data center for whatever reason, and maybe you're just doing a DR test, I can spin up another gateway. I could have this gateway already running if, if I chose. Again, all this is doable with our APIs, so you can create gateways through our API. I can then clone the last known good copy of the volume. I have no snapshots, but we always will offer you a recovery point of the volume, the last crash consistent copy of the volume that was safely stored in the cloud. I can take that clone and surface it to my back application in my recovery site, and my application can then pick up where it left off. You can do this while the primary site is running. So if you wanna do a DR failover test, you can clone a volume effectively to snatch a snapshot of that volume or a clone of that volume in real time while, the, while your primary application is still running, and we'll give you a clone of that volume that you can then do a DR recovery failover without having to take an outage on your primary. So really good for that. You can use it for cloning test data, same site recovery, a whole bunch of interesting use cases um, around being able to just take a copy of this live volume and, and use it in, in, uh, for different uh, purposes. Volume rollback is another one that we see customers using it for. The last gateway type that I like to talk about is tape. Um, tape gateway forms this drop-in replacement for existing tape infrastructure. I mentioned at the top of the presentation that it's um, a really easy way for customers to move back up an archive to the cloud. So what tape gateway provides is not just storage, but the device emulation that allows you to take a physical tape library and replace it with a virtual tape library, all backed by Amazon storage, AWS storage. In this instance, we work with all of the leading backup vendors, such that your backup admins work the way they're used to working. They don't have to know anything new. They go into their backup application, they configure a new iSCSI virtual tape library, their backup application knows how to manage tapes in that library, shuffle tapes around the, the virtual tape slots, the virtual tape robot, read and write tapes, fetch backups, et cetera. We map exporting a tape, the logical equivalent of taking a tape out of your robot and potentially giving it to your offsite vendor. We map that to moving your data down into Glacier for that lower price point. Again, all managed from your backup application. So we see customers that build large libraries of tapes. They keep their most recent backups in 
uh, the virtual tape library, and they eject tapes periodically to move them down to archive for longer term seven or 50 year retention in some cases for some customers. This is a particular example of a customer that we talked to to say, well, what's your real tape costs and how does, how does using AWS Tapler Gateway change the dynamic, change your costs? When you start to look at tape, it's very expensive. Between library maintenance, admin time, robot library refreshes, media costs, your tapes rot, right? You have, to do, you have to keep rewriting tapes to make sure they're fresh. You have to keep validating your backups. You have offsite in costs as you move your data off to an offsite vendor to keep it safely for longer term, longer terms. This instance, that costs, again, you can read the numbers, 34 and a half versus 56, 56K uh, by moving to uh, AWS Storage Gateway Tape Gateway. So how does Tape Gateway work? It's a cached model, so it's similar to uh, Volume Gateway, uh, cached and similar to File Gateway, but we're gonna keep that most recent data on site. So we talked about having a petabyte of data through 150 gigabytes. In this instance, we want to size that cache for maybe last night's backup or your near-term restores. So that if you were to restore something, you're not having to fetch it all the way from AWS. That instance, the cache is fully managed. All of your data is stored in AWS. Tapes don't get moved to the gateway. Segments of tapes get moved to the gateway as your application reads and writes them. But really, all of your data is in AWS. The gateway were to go away, the tapes are still safely stored in AWS, whether that be in the virtual tape library in S3 or off in the archive in Glacier. When you want to bring a tape back, we use standard Glacier recovery times here, so getting a tape back is three to five hours. Most offsite vendors won't give you that kind of an SLA um, for getting your data back, but you'll still get that price point of the, of the low cost Glacier storage. So this is kind of a scenario that one of our customers went with. This is a very typical, a typical tape setup for those in this world. I have a large offsite vault. I have a large tape library on-prem and my backup application is working. So how do you adopt? How do you then move to the cloud in this mode? This instance, the customer created a tape gateway. They targeted their backups to it. And now instead of writing to their physical tape library, they're writing to the virtual tape library and the data is being moved to the cloud. Now they want to say, well, what happens to my old offsite vault? Right? I still got all this physical tape, so I still have to maintain my tape library in case I need to do a restore of that backup. Again, depending on your retention period, you can either let those tapes age out. Oh, there you go, animation. Um, you can either let those tapes age out. If you have a 50 year retention, maybe that's not practical. You want to get off your offsite vault a little faster. This instance, your backup application can clone tapes. He can copy tapes. Right? So you can set up a background job in your backup app to create new tapes and move those to the cloud as well, allowing you to slowly uh, minimize the size of your offline vault, either because of time or because you're migrating them, and eventually get rid of your on-premises physical infrastructure. And now all of your backups and all of your archive is off in AWS. So a really seamless transition for most backup admins, and a very easy way um, to adopt the cloud and, and, and sort of get, again, get comfortable with it, get used to moving your data and having your data in the cloud. We do offer Tape Gateway, again, as an on-prem uh, virtual machine for VMware or Hyper-V, or you can run it in the cloud. And some of our customers choose to run the Tape Gateway in the cloud on EC2. Again, minimizing their on-prem footprint of infrastructure. Um, last slide, and we do have a little bit of time for questions, if anybody has any. Um, thank you for coming. I hope today has been useful, either this session and the others that you've attended. Um, Again, more than happy to answer any questions. I'm sure Scott is as well. Um, and thanks for coming. Test. I've got a question for you, Jason. Yeah. Um, do any of the um, cloud storage offerings um, include a data deduplication capability? So Storage Gateway doesn't do data duplication um, as of today. Um, for volume and tape, we do um, fairly aggressive compression of your data. Um, there are partner offerings that do de data deduplication. I'd love to talk to you about you know, what your particular use case is um, on, on that. Hi. So first, great in the SMB, big ask from some of the clients I work with. <laughs> 
Um, will we need a separate virtual appliance to service SMB from NFS, or can we use one virtual appliance for both? Um, so one virtual appliance will surface shares that are either SMB or NFS, um, and so you can mix and match on a single appliance. Awesome, thank you. Just a quick question. The gateway, are they um, VMs or appliance? You know? So today we, they're a VM. Um, and so we provide that VM during the activation process uh, through the AWS console, either uh, for VMware or various versions of Hyper-V. Okay. Um, if you're in cloud, the EC2 instance is obviously an AMI. Okay. So you, you don't have any plans to do appliance on site? Okay. Um, let's talk about what you need there. I'd, I'd love to understand what your requirement is. Yeah. Thank you. Any more? So for the, I guess, the, um, the SMB part of it? Yep. So, I don't know, we have about 100,000 shares, 15 terabytes of data, mostly for like home shares and um, home directories, department shares, that type of thing. Is this a good use case for that uh, scenario? Um, so the, the, the question that you want to ask yourself is where do you want that data to be stored? And if you want that data to be stored in S3 because you, the, the broader feature set that S3 provides, then it's a good use case for file gateway with SMB. And if your use case is all file-based, then we should have a different discussion about maybe other services that we can offer that would help with that. Okay. Any more? Sorry, the lights are blinding, so I actually can't see as people walk up. Any, any more questions? And I'm happy to take some offline here if people don't feel comfortable walking up to the mic. Thanks, everybody. Hope the rest of your day is good.